So Hezekiah, faith to overcome. We are now in class number two out of our six, dedication and Passover. Our big goal is to come to know Hezekiah as a friend and a brother, to see he was a real person, a real man, and to understand then how every time that God hit him with these trials, with these things that broke him, how he was able to overcome. Now, if you remember, there's six things that you're supposed to keep in mind. So yesterday's core lesson was, now I have to remember it, all things work together for good. Okay, so that was core lesson from yesterday. All right. Now, what we're going to be doing today is we are going to be spending some time looking at Hezekiah's reforms and his heroes. So today's class is just split into two parts. So the reforms and heroes, that'll be the first section that we look at. Then we're going to be spending time looking at how he affected the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just to give you a little bit of an idea as to where we're going to go with the reforms and heroes, Hezekiah, as we showed yesterday, had a lot of people that he looked up to, a lot of heroes. We're just going to see a few. We're going to spend time looking at Moses, at Solomon, and at Jehoshaphat. So Moses, Solomon, Jehoshaphat. Now, I originally also had Micah in there, but uh, we don't have time to look at Micah. So if you want to hear about Micah the hero, you can come and talk to me afterward. But so we have Moses, Solomon, and Jehoshaphat. So those are the three men that we're going to look at. We're going to see how those men inspired Hezekiah to take action, to do this Passover, to create this dedication, to bring the people into a covenant with their God. And I think this is such a powerful thing when we come together and we, we read Scripture Look for these kind of things. Ask yourself, why did this person do this? Does this remind me of anyone else? And oftentimes you can see patterns as we're going to. We're going to be able to see, I think, that Hezekiah patterned what he did off of these three men. So we'll see the reforms and heroes. Then we'll see how I think he was an inspiration for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll be spending some time on types. Remember, that's our, our third guiding principle here. Look for the Lord Jesus in everything. Now, a class is not complete without asking why. And so, in fact, you should feel very privileged because not only are we going to ask why once, but today we're going to ask why twice. So you get, you get uh, double duty here. So number one, why was Hezekiah so intent on celebrating Passover? He seems to have this, this feverish desire, we have to celebrate Passover. And we'll see how that comes out. Then the next is, why was he so focused on inviting all of Israel to the Passover, not just Judah. So first why question is, why was he so focused on celebrating Passover? Second is, why all Israel? Well, let's take a look. Our core lesson today is God wants us, do you remember without me telling you? To remember the past, that's right. So God wants us to remember the past. What we're going to see is that in the past, God shows us that he can conquer the impossible. He showed it with Moses he, at the Red Sea. He showed it with Solomon in giving him wisdom. And he showed it with Jehoshaphat. You remember the story in which Jehoshaphat went out and the army sang, right? We're going to see that you know, Hezekiah loves that story. He, he quotes it, I think, later on, actually. We'll talk about that. So God wants us to remember the past because it reminds us that he can do the impossible. Now, our supplemental lesson is that God can use one person to make a difference and he wants us to seek the lost without compromise. That's an important point that's going to come out of this. Seek the lost, constantly be trying to bring them back, but without compromising on our principles. Okay, so just a quick recap. We read 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Now, what happens in 2 Chronicles 30 or sorry, we did read 30, but what happens in, in chapter 29 is Hezekiah gathers together all the Levites. We're going to read this. 2 Chronicles 29. Second Chronicles 29, starting at verse 4, we get to read a little more about the filthiness. I hope that you've remembered your challenge. 2 Chronicles 29, verse 4. It says there, And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. 
and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So Hezekiah gathers them all together in the East Street, and he says, it's time to make a change. Sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house, and we're going to take out all this filthiness. No more of this in the temple. And he goes on and he explains then that this is why. In verses 6 through 9, he said, God's judgment has fallen upon us. You know, you, you look out and you can see that we have these families that have been taken into captivity. You see that we've been made an astonishment and a hissing. So we're going to change things. We're going to make a change because God's judgment now is upon us. And so he says, this is my plan. Verse 10, we're going to get together and we're going to cause the people to make a covenant with Yahweh. Just uh, similar to what Asa had done. He says, we're going to bring together the people to make this covenant. Now, really, remember, what day was this when he did it? It was first day, first month, first year. Now, that's right around Passover time, right? So it's right around Passover time. So really, what better time to do this? First day, first month, first year. It's almost Passover. He's going to bring the temple back together. What better time to do that than Passover? This is a time when people are remembering God's salvation, and it's a good time to rededicate. So you can see Hezekiah thinking this. So what happens is, verse 17, they begin on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Now, that is pretty impressive. Do you remember how long Asa, sorry, Ahaz, remember how long Ahaz reigned? 16 years, right? 16 years Ahaz reigned, and they were able to clean out the temple in 16 days. So 16 years of filth removed in 16 days. That's pretty awesome, right? Can, can you just imagine, you know, if you had gone out and, and lived 16 years of filth, and then suddenly 16 days uh, of, you know, repentance, you're back to new again, right? This, this is good. This was a, a very quick, but the problem was, it wasn't quick enough because Passover was what day of the month? 14th day of the first month. Can you just picture, here's Hezekiah. He has this plan, right? This is a real thing that happened. He has this plan and he's thinking, we've got to make a covenant. We have to clean out the temple. Passover, what a time to do this. And as the 12th day comes, can you imagine Hezekiah going to the temple and looking and thinking, two days, on the 14th day, Hezekiah gets up, Passover, and he goes to the temple. Oh, we missed it. And it's the 16th day, and they weren't fast enough. Passover happened, we know, on the 14th day. We know that Leviticus 23 is very clear. Leviticus 23, verses 4 and 6, Passover had happened the, first, the 14th day of the first month. Now, the neat thing about this and uh, this is constantly what you see with Hezekiah, right? We're looking at overcoming. And even just in the little things, Hezekiah has this plan. We're going to do this, this Passover here, uh, this dedication on Passover, and it doesn't work. And he says, oh, well. And just look at, look at what he does. He doesn't, you know, uh, we, might, we might get upset, right? We might say, ah, oh, nothing works out. Yeah, have you ever said that? Nothing works out when I try and do it, Right? And yet, we don't see that at all. It's very interesting. In fact, what happens is, on the 16th day, once everything is done, the next day, we're told, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 20, Hezekiah gets up early, and he says, oh, well, we'll do it anyway. Two, three days after Passover, it's okay, right? And, and so, he gets them together anyway, and they still make a covenant. And in fact, the whole thing is wildly successful. In verse 31, we find out that all the people come and they willingly offer in this covenant to God. So what a change, right? This had been the nation where the temple had been closed and nobody had been worshiping God. There were altars everywhere in Jerusalem to these different, to these different deities. And suddenly the people are now willingly offering. Hezekiah was not dissuaded. And it's amazing, in fact, even more, because as it says there, it was done suddenly, right? We're talking two weeks. Two weeks, the whole nation flips around, right? Okay. Well, this was mission accomplished, right? This is what Hezekiah wanted to do. He had said, we're going to make a covenant, we're going to turn around the people, and uh, it happened. 
17 days later, it's done. But what's amazing is, you look at that and you think, wow, you know, Hezekiah must have been happy. Now it was time to sit back and relax. Do you ever feel that way? You finish uh, what you had wanted to do in the Ecclesia and you think, yes. Now I finished that exhortation. Now I'm taking a nap, right? You know, now it's time to relax. And what's amazing that you see so often in, in these Bible characters is that they say, I finished this, what can I do next? And here's Hezekiah. He finished what he did. The people have made this covenant, and Hezekiah says, but we're not done because we miss Passover. And he has this burning desire here to celebrate Passover. And so again, I think this is where we have to constantly be asking as we read, we have to ask the question, why? What's, what's with this? You know, if, if this were you, or I don't, you know, I don't know what you would do. If this were me, I would say, well, we missed it by two days. It's okay because in about 48 days, we're going to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. And you know, it'll be all right. We'll just wait a few weeks and everything will be good. We'll celebrate our feast. And that's great. We did it. Celebrated a feast. But Hezekiah says, no, we have to celebrate Passover. Why? All right. Well, remember, as you, as you go through these stories, constantly be thinking about the heroes. Now, Passover, that, I think, has a pretty immediate connection to one of the heroes. So this, I think, is Moses. Now, just take a little bit of time. I want, I want us to step back and think about what the situation was like with Israel during the time of Moses. Passover was supposed to be a time for the Israelites during the time of Moses to think about God's deliverance, right? When God passed over them and slew the Egyptian firstborn. Now, let's just think about their situation. First of all, what, uh, what was Israel's religious situation at the time of the first Passover? Any thoughts? Pretty rotten. Wow, that's a good description. Desperate. Pretty rotten, desperate, right? Exodus chapter 2 has them crying out to Yahweh, it says. They cried out to Yahweh, and when they did that, he heard them and he remembered them. And it was also pretty rotten. Now, um, what's funny is we don't actually read this in the Exodus account, but when you take a look at a few other passages, we find out that at that time, Israel was also worshiping idols. So let's take a look at this. Come on over to uh, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24, we want verse 14. This is one of those things that uh, if you haven't looked at this before with the Exodus, just you want to somehow make sure that you get this penciled in or something in, in your Exodus chapters there so that you can see that when you start reading the Exodus, we aren't looking at a group of faithful people, right? We are looking at an idolatrous Israel. This is Joshua 24. Take a look at verse 14. Now, this is just put away, just tucked away into the record. And again, this is, this is where careful reading comes in. Joshua 24, verse 14. Notice what Joshua says to the people. Verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. Here it is. And in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So notice that that while Exodus doesn't tell us that the people were idolatrous while they're in Egypt, Joshua comes out and he says, put away those gods that your fathers worshipped in Egypt. Hmm. Now, in fact, I think we also have another indication of this. If you come on over to uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, just one more here. Again, it's not in the Exodus account, but Ezekiel chapter 20 really brings this out perhaps even stronger than Joshua does. Ezekiel 20, God is looking back on Israel's history and here he describes his plea with them to turn around when they were in Egypt. So Ezekiel 20, we're going to start here at verse 5. Ezekiel 20, verse 5. I know it says verse 7 up there, but uh, we're going to start at 5. Ezekiel 20, verse 5. God says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, made myself known unto them, here's our context, in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up my hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God, in the day that I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I despised for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, then said I unto them, 
Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes. Defile ye not yourselves with the idols of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish mine anger in the midst of the land of Egypt. And if you've ever wondered why it was that Israel received some of the plagues that were poured out on the Egyptians and didn't receive some of the others, I would suggest to you that the answer is right there in verse 8. God would pour out his fury upon them. So what you see is you have an Israel that was idolatrous at the time. Now, that was slightly tangential. But wasn't it cool? Wasn't it? Like, it's, it's helpful to just see, I think, that that's really the context of what's going on with, with Israel in Egypt. Now, here's why this is helpful. Because not only was Israel worshiping idols, but at that time, when they first celebrated the Passover, they were oppressed by Egypt. Now, that's kind of obvious, right? But the reason that this is important is when you look back at how God describes this oppression, he uses a certain word. Our word right there in the Hebrew, it's the word evid. It means slave or servant. Now, does that make you think of anything at all that happened in the life of Hezekiah? We talked about it yesterday. That was a slightly different word. It was the same root word. It was avdecha. It was when Ahaz said, I am your servant and your son. It's right there, 2 Kings 16, verse 7. Same root word there. The two connect. So what's interesting is that when Israel was in Egypt, they were slaves, just like Judah was to Assyria. Hmm. Not only that, but we're specifically, we know as well, that at the time of the Passover, their families were also in captivity. So here's really the situation. Israel, at the time of the Passover, was overcome by idols. They, uh, not only so, but they were slaves in Egypt, and their families were in captivity. Now, I would suggest to you that what happens here is that Hezekiah looks out and he says, this is the exact same situation, except Egypt has been replaced by Assyria. He says, this is the same thing. And so he realizes that the first thing that needs to happen when he becomes king is that the people need to realize that they can be delivered from this oppressor because God did it before. And Hezekiah stands up and he says, we're going to celebrate Passover because you need to remember the past. Remember that God has done it before. And so when he stands up and he talks to the priests and the Levites there in 2 Chronicles 29, he says, we have been overcome by idols. The temple has been closed. Then when he sends out the message about Passover, he says to the people, we've been oppressed by Assyria. He then says to them, and your families are in captivity. This is the same situation. And he brings this out to them, I think. So he has this fixation on celebrating Passover because I would put to you, he recognizes this is the same situation. Now, it's possible that he had some help in that. Because if you start reading through Isaiah, in fact, Isaiah seems to parallel the two events as well. So in Isaiah chapter 10, Isaiah 10 verse 24, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwelleth in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and here it is, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. So Isaiah himself says this is the same kind of situation. Just like what Egypt did, Assyria is going to do the same thing. Isaiah 52, verses 4 and 5. Thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. They went into Egypt, and now the Assyrian oppresses them without cause. So I think you have this parallel here. And Hosea, and, uh, not Hosea, Hezekiah saw that. That this was the same kind of situation. And yet at the same time, I would put to you that it wasn't just Moses. Right, this, is, this is Hezekiah's mind. Can you, just, can you imagine uh, thinking in this kind of way? He constantly said, has this happened before? Has this situation taken place before? What do I know about the scriptural record that matches up with this scenario? And so Hezekiah thought of Moses, and I would put to you that he thought of another man. Now, this is the part where you're going to want your handout. Because we're not going to look up all these verses. So this is the handout, the first section here. And it's about uh, Hezekiah and a king named Solomon. Now, as you start to read through the story of Hezekiah, I think you'll see that 
out of all of his heroes, far and above, Hezekiah's greatest love and his greatest dream was to become like Solomon. And uh, in fact, in part two, which sorry, we won't get to, but in part two, uh, you can see that this becomes one of the driving forces in his life. And essentially, at the end of his life, his kingdom is like Solomon's. The nations are coming to him, offering him gifts. He's teaching them about Yahweh. There's, there's so many connections here to Solomon. Let's just look at a couple. You have them all in your handout, and they're, uh, they're spelled out a little better than they are here. But uh, here they are. First major project is to open the doors of the temple. Same for both of them. Hezekiah promises deliverance to the people. When, he, uh, when he's talking to them about Passover, he says, Yahweh will deliver you if you turn back to him. Now, that's not just something that he could say, right? It, he couldn't just stand up and make that up. People would say, what do you mean? What's your proof? How, what do you mean that Yahweh is going to bring our families back out of captivity? And what's interesting is, that's taken, I would suggest to you, straight from Solomon's prayer. Remember when he stands up at the, the dedication of the temple? And he says, if our people are in captivity, if they turn to you and pray in this temple, then you will bring them back. And so I think Hezekiah is thinking about this whole thing when he tells them that God will turn back to you and he will bring your families back. Number three, Hezekiah uses the families of Heman, Asaph, and Jeduthun in all the temple worship. And uh, in fact, one of the interesting things is this happens to be, 2 Chronicles 29, just so happens to be the very next time in the whole scriptural record that they appear. So they're there in the time of Solomon, and they just disappear until the time of Hezekiah. And so he brings them out again. Not only that, he has the Levites singing at the dedication, but in addition, they use the same instruments, cymbals, psalteries, and harps. Um, has a, this one I find really interesting. Come over to 1 Kings chapter 4, and just take a look at the way in which Solomon's kingdom is described. 1 Kings chapter 4. You want to notice a little phrase here. 1 Kings 4, 1 Kings 4 and verse 25. Now, there's actually two phrases that you'll want to notice in this that remind us of Hezekiah. Now, you only have one on the screen, so see if you can find the other one. Two phrases here that remind us of Hezekiah in verse 25. 1 Kings 4, 25. It says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon... Now, our first one here is from Dan to Beersheba. So just keep it in your mind that Solomon reigned from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. Now, did you see the other phrase? Every man under his vine and fig tree. Now, that's interesting because do you know where else that shows up? Shows up as a description I would put to you of Hezekiah's reign in Micah chapter 4. Now, we'll see that a little bit later. There's another place where it shows up in Zechariah, and that's, that's a whole other story. But I would put to you that those are also connected. We can talk later. 1 Kings 4. From Dan to Beersheba. Now here's why this is interesting. Come on over to 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and take a look in 2 Chronicles 30 the way that Hezekiah's Passover is described. Because this one is a little bit different. Now Solomon reigned from Dan to Beersheba, right? Hezekiah is now deciding who to invite to Passover and he reigns over Judah, not Israel. And yet, when deciding who to invite to Passover, notice who he invites. Verse 5. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 5. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. Why do you think Hezekiah did it from Beersheba to Dan? I would put to you, it was because of Solomon. Now on top of that, both pray that God would forgive the people according to their heart. Both celebrate this double feast. Now, uh, we were going to look at that yesterday, but we can do it today. Good. Let's, let's just take a look. This will be the last one that we look at. Come on over to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles 7, and notice what it says here about Solomon and his dedication of the temple. At Solomon's dedication of the temple, now, this is the only time that this happens. 2 Chronicles 7, and it says there in verse 9, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 9. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar, notice this, seven days, and the feast seven days. So what you have is a feast for the altar for seven days and a feast for the temple for seven days. That's a total of 14 days, two weeks, two feasts. 
That's interesting because if you come on over now to 2 Chronicles chapter 30, there's one other king who does that. Now, you can probably guess who that is. One other king who celebrates a double feast like this. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And you'll see it there in verse 23. 2 Chronicles 30 verse 23. It says, 2 Chronicles 30, 23. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep other seven days. And they kept other seven days with gladness. So they celebrate Passover for seven days. And then they get together and they say, why don't we have a double feast? Like the days of Solomon. And so they celebrate a double feast. Only other time, as far as I can tell, that that happened. Now, during Hezekiah's reign, Scripture describes the temple as God's dwelling place. You'll see it comes up there in 2 Chronicles 30, 27. It says they cleaned up God's dwelling place and dedicated it. 2 Chronicles 30, 27. Do you know why that's interesting? We always talk about the temple as God's dwelling place. Sometimes we'll refer to the ecclesial hall as the dwelling place of God. But did you know that that's actually a phrase that finds its origin in 2 Kings chapter 8? Do you know what happened in 2 Kings chapter 8? That was Solomon's dedication prayer of the temple. And he keeps saying, here in heaven your dwelling place, and come here to the temple, your dwelling place. So he brings out this idea of your dwelling place. The next time that shows up is with Hezekiah. And the record calls the temple God's dwelling place. Now, just a few more. Hezekiah rebuilds a place called Milo. It's hard to know exactly what that was. Uh, it seems like it's some kind of fortification, some kind of defense outside around Jerusalem, some type of wall maybe. And, uh, you know, there's one other king who did that. His name was Solomon. In addition to that, Hezekiah receives gifts from all the nations, just like Solomon. And finally, both kings have their reigns described with the word, every man under his vine and fig tree. All right. So, if so many things in his early life, then, were inspired by Solomon, I would put to you that, in fact, Hezekiah's Passover, then, too, would also seem to be inspired by Solomon. And, you know, we almost have an indication of that in the record. If you're still in 2 Chronicles 30, just take a look at what it says in verse 26. See if you can see, if you can see it. Hezekiah's Passover modeled on Solomon's. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 26. So there was great joy in Jerusalem... For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Now, that's a very interesting thing for the record to say. It says, since the time of Solomon, there was no Passover like this, like what Hezekiah celebrated. And, you know, you might say, okay, well, that's great. They didn't celebrate Passover since the time of Solomon. And, okay, that's true. But it gets very interesting when you just hold your hand here in 2 Chronicles 30, and you take a look over at 2 Chronicles 35, because notice what happens in 2 Chronicles 35. This is now the story of Josiah. And Josiah also celebrates a Passover, right? And yet, his Passover is described very differently than Hezekiah's. Take a look at what it says in verse 18. 2 Chronicles 35, 18, it says, And there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel? Well, now, wait a minute. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why is it that the record specifically says of Hezekiah that his Passover, there was nothing celebrated like that all the way back to Solomon? And then when you come later, Josiah's Passover skips over Hezekiah's, skips over Solomon's, and goes straight to Samuel. What happened? I would put to you that the reason is because Hezekiah's was modeled on Solomon's Passover. And so it says there was nothing like this except for Solomon's because he was doing the same thing. Now, in addition, it would seem like Josiah's Passover was also very much to the letter, to the letter of the law, whereas Hezekiah's, not quite. Second month, people weren't sanctified. Didn't quite go that way. All right. So maybe that's why Hezekiah was so intent on celebrating Passover. So that's the first thing. Now, what he does then to figure out what to do is he gathers the people together, 2 Chronicles 30, we read it today, and he says, we have a problem. We missed it. What are we going to do? And somebody says, well, if you look at Numbers chapter 9, you'll see that, in fact, there's a provision for those who are unclean or for those who are on a journey to celebrate Passover in the second month, right? And you can just picture Hezekiah thinking, that's us, right? The temple was filled with filthiness, you know, of course we fit this unclean picture. The people were on a journey. Well, you know, nobody was even expecting this. 
So yeah, they're on a journey. So yeah, let's try the second month. And yet, there's a little more to this. Because what Hezekiah does is in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 5, he specifically says to, to his couriers, you're not just going to go throughout Judah, but I want you to go to all Israel. And so now this was our second question, right? Why all Israel? And the question becomes especially strong when you start to just think about it. Can you think of any reasons why Hezekiah would have been tempted to not have anything to do with Israel? Yeah, Matt? Uh, they were invaded by the Babylonian Yeah, so do you remember that yesterday? Israel invaded Judah. That's not really the kind of people that you want to like walk up to and be like, hey, want to have a feast? Right? You know, what's going on there? That's not really all that great of a relationship. On top of that, so just take a look. Number one, right, they're another country. It's not normal for a king of one country to say, excuse me, um, how do you feel about sending your entire population to my country for a week? Right? That does not happen. Now, number two, Israel had been faithless for generations, right? First Kings chapter 12, this all starts with Jeroboam, and it continues all the way in 2 Kings 17. It says Israel was removed before God because of the sins of Jeroboam. So they were faithless the whole time. So Hezekiah could have easily just said, man, look at these people, right? They don't want to celebrate Passover, obviously. They're worshiping cows. Now, on top of that, bitter enemies, right? They invaded Judah, as we said. They invaded Judah, 2 Chronicles 28, verse 5. But it was more than just that, because, in fact, they had a personal debt with Hezekiah. Let me show you what I mean with it. They killed 120,000 of Judah in one day. And, you know, one of those people actually just so happened to be Hezekiah's brother, In 2 Chronicles 28, verse 7, it it says, And they killed Masaiah, the king's son. So Israel invaded Judah. In one day, they killed 120,000 people. They were full of idolatry, and they killed Hezekiah's brother. Now, can you just imagine, at this meeting, Hezekiah says, And who should we invite? We've decided we're going to do it in the second month. Who should we invite? And the people say, Well, uh, Judah, obviously. And Hezekiah says, What about Israel? You you can just picture. Can you see the people at the table? What? Israel? What are you thinking? They killed your brother, Hezekiah. And what's astonishing is that... Can you imagine that kind of forgiveness? Of, Of one man saying, these people need to know the truth of God, They need to know the love of God so strongly, it doesn't matter what they did to me. They need to see it. They need to see the light. So he puts it behind him. Now, what's important to notice, though, is that, in fact, he had actually wanted this from the very beginning. In 2 Chronicles 29, verse 24, you might notice that uh, when he offers, when he brings the people together into this covenant... 2 Chronicles 29, 24, it actually says that he offered his offering for all Israel as well. So from the very beginning, this was in his mind. I'm going to bring back all Israel. But here's what's extremely important to notice. The reason why. Why was he so intent on bringing back Israel? And I would put to you, once again, look to the heroes. Because you might recall Jehoshaphat had a similar desire. Remember that? When you read through the story of Jehoshaphat, this is something that you just can't really get past. You, you read words like, I am as you are. My people as your people. Jehoshaphat was bent on bringing, getting together with Israel. Now, he didn't quite do it in the right way. We're going to see that. Just take a look. You'll see, some, uh, you'll see some themes here as we go through this story. Now, I'm going to apologize to you in advance. This is not in chronological order. I hope that you can handle that. This is in book of the Bible order because I can't handle it when it's not in book of the Bible order. So, this is actually the last, this chronologically is the last event. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 7, Hezekiah gets together with uh, Jehoram. Jehoram, who is Ahab's son. And he says to Jehoram, I am as thou art. Now, Jehoram says, hey, will you come and fight this battle with me? Right? You might remember the story. Will you come and fight the battle with me? Hezekiah says, well, or uh, 
Jehoshaphat says, well, is there a prophet of the Lord? And Jehoram says, yes, there is. His name is Elisha. And Jehoshaphat says, oh, Elisha. Right? And they go before Elisha, and Elisha says, you're with him? Right? And he looks at Jehoshaphat, and he says to Jehoram, if it were not for the fact that I respect Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you to Jehoram. Now, you would think that this should be some kind of immediate hint, right? That if a prophet says to the man that you're with, I wouldn't even look at that man because he's so terrible, right? That that probably means saying to him, I am as thou art, is probably wasn't a good idea to say. Now, that's what Elisha says. He says there in 2 Kings 3, verse 14, I would not even look towards you. 2 Chronicles 18, 1, now we're going back in time. 2 Chronicles 18, 1, we're told that Jehoshaphat makes affinity with Ahab. Not really a good plan. Because in 2 Chronicles 18, 3, this is now the story where Ahab says, similar kind of thing to Jehoram, will you go into battle with me against Ramoth Gilead? Right? Jehoshaphat says his famous line, I am as thou art. He says to Ahab, and Ahab says, perfect. Well, let's go to battle. And Jehoshaphat says, wait, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Prophet of the Lord? And remember this? There is, but I hate him, says Ahab. Now, that's it, probably indication number one. This is not a real good place to be. And Jehoshaphat says, okay, great. There's a prophet. Bring him out. So they bring out Micaiah, and uh, Micaiah says to Ahab, after you know, a little bit of coaxing, I saw all Israel scattered as sheep without a shepherd. Ahab, you're going to die. Right? And Ahab says, oh, wow. Didn't I tell you I hate this man? Okay. So then, Ahab and Jehoshaphat are sitting there. They're getting ready for battle, right? And Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, I got a perfect plan. Ready? I'm going to go out into battle wearing my normal clothes, right? And why don't you dress up as your, your kingly self? Isn't that great? You'll feel all important, and I, I'm just Ahab, right? And Jehoshaphat says, well, okay. You know, and they go out into battle, right? And it says, and Josh Jehoshaphat cried out to Yahweh because the people say, there's the king, and they chase him down. Okay, now that's probably indication number two that saying, I am as thou art, is not a very good plan when you're working with someone like Ahab or his sons. So he gets that. Now, in the next chapter then, in 2 Chronicles 19, Jehoshaphat then is approached by Jehu the prophet who says, is it right for you to love the ungodly and those who hate Yahweh? So these are Jehoshaphat's attempts now to bring together all Israel. So he says, I am as you are. He loves the ungodly. He has burning desire, though, fixated on bringing Israel back. And so he says, well, we'll just be friends. Now, for a while then, he listens, and he doesn't have anything to do with Ahab or his children. But after that, we're told in 2 Chronicles 20 that he joins himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel. Prophet comes, and he says, Jehoshaphat, we went through this. And so then in chapter 20, verse 37, these ships that he's making with Ahaziah, it says God broke them all. Indication number, what, four now? These are probably not the best people to hang out with. So this is Jehoshaphat trying to bring together Israel and Judah, and the whole thing is, is a mess, right? He doesn't go about it in the right way. And it's not just a mess. This is like a major mess, because it comes out destroying both spiritually and physically his whole family. Just take a look. 2 Kings 8, verses 16 and 18. It says, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign, and he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, son of Jehoshaphat, as did the house of Ahab. Why? For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And so what happens is Jehoshaphat gets all buddy-buddy with Israel, with Ahab, right? And he says, oh, well, just be friends so that I can bring him back into the fold and... He destroys his family. His son is not like the kings of Judah, but is the kings of Israel because he married the daughter of Ahab. And so what happens in 2 Kings chapter 9 is that Jehu is told to destroy the whole house of Ahab. He's then told in verse 8 that the whole house of Ahab shall perish. Verse 27, Jehu goes out and he kills Ahaziah, Jehoshaphat's grandson. So now because Ahaziah, Jehoshaphat's grandson, walked in the way of the kings of Israel because of Jehoshaphat's affinity with Ahab, Ahaziah dies. Jehoshaphat's grandson dies because of that. 2 Kings chapter 10, the same thing happens, but on an even bigger scale. Jehu comes and kills 42 of Ahaziah's brothers for the same reason. 
And then finally, in 2 Kings 11, verse 1, Athaliah just goes and finishes everybody else off. This is what happens with Jehu coming to, or with Jehoshaphat coming to all Israel and thinking, I'll bring them back just by being friends. And so what's interesting about this is that Hezekiah works for their restoration, all Israel, because he's encouraged, I think, by Jehoshaphat. But he learns from the past. Remember, the, the lesson is God wants us to remember the past. And so Hezekiah then, therefore, goes and learns from what Jehoshaphat had done. Now, let's just take a look at this and see, because Hezekiah had a lot of care when he invited Israel. He didn't just say, hey, do you want to, like, you know, meet in the middle? We're going to have our little feast. You know, you're up in Israel. You've been idolatrous for a long time, but we'll just be friends. Hezekiah was very specific. Take a look. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Let's read through what he said, and uh, we'll start to wrap it up. 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and verse 6. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 6 says, So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, according to the commandment of the king, saying, Now as we read these words, look for what might be deemed offensive. Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land." For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. Now, can you imagine getting a letter like that? You open it up, oh boy, a letter, right? You open it up and it says, don't be stiff-necked. And you're like, whoa, what a, what a way to start a letter, right? I mean, this is what, this is what Hezekiah says. Don't be stiff-necked like your fathers were. Turn to God, and if you do, he'll come to you. Now, it's, this is pretty huge. Hezekiah doesn't water down the message. He makes it very clear, listen, you guys are messed up. And we're not just going to meet in the middle kind of thing. But you need to turn again. Don't be like your fathers. Don't be stiff-necked. Turn again. It's, it's like three verses long. And in the midst of this three-verse long thing, he says over and over and over, you need to repent. Then, in addition to that, did you notice where it was that he was going to meet them? He says, enter into his sanctuary. He says, we're not meeting except in the temple. You're coming to Judah. I'm not going to Israel. Now, I think that this is huge. This is just a big thing for us to remember. So the last thing to say, we have a burning desire and we have a command to seek the lost. Those who have gone away, those who have gone astray, those who are lost in the ecclesia, we're told to look for them. And yet, we're supposed to search like the Lord Jesus Christ, like the one who's called the Word made flesh, the one who says, the words that I speak are not my own, but they're my Father's. When you sat with the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you think you heard? You heard an exposition of the Old Testament. You heard, this is my Father, and this is what he stands for. You didn't hear, oh, uh, how do you think that uh, sports game went yesterday? Right? When... Christ sought for the lost. He was very specific on what terms. He didn't just go hang out with people. He didn't just say, oh, you're my friend, you know, let's, let's go do whatever it is that we might do. But he said, if you're going to come here, we're going to talk scripture. And so I think this is very important that when we seek the lost, we have a choice. Are we going to seek like Jehoshaphat or Hezekiah? We can see the effects, I think, of both. Because with Hezekiah, he laid down the line in the sand. And he said, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to come here because this is truth. And this is right. And we're not going to have compromise. And the people did. And what happens after all of this in 2 Chronicles chapter 30 is that there's a huge revival. And in fact, people from Israel start tearing down the idols in Judah. And then they go back to Israel and tear down the idols in Israel. Because Hezekiah wouldn't give in. Now, when we seek the lost, I think that's a huge exhortation for us. 
So what we see in this story in terms of overcoming is that God wants us to remember the past. We remember the past, we look back, we're encouraged by it, but not only that, we learn from it. And we see that just as God has worked before in the past, and he's overcome these situations, he has the power to do it again. But regardless of if he does, all things are working for good.